Well, the potential of another Trump presidency loomed over the federal cabinet retreat here in Montreal. The final day of these meetings focused on Canada-U.S. relations. Here's the Prime Minister speaking about a possible Trump win. Obviously, uh, Mr. Trump uh, represents a certain amount of, uh, of unpredictability, uh, but uh, we uh, will make sure we're pulling together and preparing for whatever eventualities. Kirsten Hillman is Canada's ambassador to the United States. She's here in Montreal from Washington for today's cabinet retreat. Ambassador Hillman, it's good to see you again. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about this effort, this task force uh, that, that the government is setting up to prepare for the U.S. election. Is this something you would be doing if it was just a normal U.S. election, or is it something you're doing because Donald Trump could possibly win this election? I think that it's something that we're doing because it is a consequential election with consequential issues on the table. I think we would be doing a version of this no matter what, um, but the focus and probably intensity is a little bit more because there are a lot of things at stake in the Canada-U.S. relationship that are vital and that we want to make sure that we handle as best we can to put Canada in the best position possible. I mean, the stakes are obviously always high in a U.S. election, but they seem higher now. I, I mean, the Donald Trump who is running now has a different record and a different legacy and a different group of people around him than last time. H how do you see the potential stakes of this election compared to 2016? So one of the things that I, I talked to the captain about this morning, and I think it's really important for everybody to keep in the back of their minds, there's a lot of discussion around uh, Donald Trump, um, his previous presidency, uh, his candidacy potentially this time. But this election is also an election of every single member of the House, 435 members of the House, mm -hmm. 34 senators, 11 governors, uh, five of them from states that border Canada. And when we try and get stuff done in the United States, when we try and make sure the Canadian voice is heard, of course the White House is really important, but governors and members of Congress are crucial to getting things done. And often they're really important allies when maybe we don't see completely eye to eye with, with the White House, whether it's a Democratic or a Republican White House. Right, and certainly you haven't seen eye to eye with Joe Biden uh, during the four years of his presidency, but the rules of engagement around those disagreements seem more normal, more typical, right? Like the, the rules-based world order applies in a Biden White House. You've heard, you know, Donald Trump saying he would be a dictator on day one. You, you know, we've seen, you know, what happened on January 6th and, and the low levels of trust in the elections uh, in, in the country. It's all very concerning, right? So, so what's the number one thing you're worried about as we head into the, the heat of this uh, U.S. election cycle? I think the number one thing that I'm focused on uh, is taking the, talking about the issues and making my team, having our team in the United States and those who we will be working with over the coming months here in the context of this task force and elsewhere, focus on the issues, focus on what matters, what we need to be conveying to Americans. And if I have a tagline for this, it's making sure Americans understand that their relationship with Canada is a source of strength for them. That's not a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. People who have uh, jobs, that rely on Canadian investment, people who have supply chains that rely on Canadian inputs or who purchase Im inputs from U.S. producers, uh, people who are interested in ensuring our national security, um, who, who are involved in our joint law enforcement. So energy security, national security, um, economic security, environmental security, rarely at the local level where people really care about it break down on partisan lines. You can find people at the local level, the state level, the congressional yeah. level uh, to reach out to and work with. There was conversation in 2015, 2016 that there were some moderates around Donald yeah. Trump. I don't know if those moderates are there anymore. A lot of them left during his presidency and they sort of disavowed the, the, the mega political culture. I mean, who are the people around Donald Trump that could be the people that Canada can reach out to uh, to forge those relationships with? Well, that's exactly what we're in the process of sort of compiling and mapping right now. So we have a, and have had for months in D.C. a process underway where not just in Washington, but our team of, of 12 consulates across the country have been state by state um, compiling lists of who are the potential electees, who are their influencers, who are the main players in the business community, and making sure that we have contacts into all of those communities. Sometimes those are Republican communities, sometimes they're Democratic, Democrat communities. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing, sort of systematic, very uh, methodical uh, um, collab uh, gathering of information and then deploying of, of, of people to talk to. 
How much does the domestic political strategy of the government affect your diplomatic strategy in the United States? You, I'm sure you've seen the ads the liberals are running comparing Pierre Polyev to Donald Trump and using the specter of Donald Trump to criticize their main political rival. Surely that's been noticed in the United States. People have seen that. You know, unfortunately, I think Americans pay a little less attention to us than we'd like them to. And sometimes that's a challenge because we want them to be focusing on things that are happening in our country. But sometimes, you know, it just it is what it is. So I, it isn't something that has really come up with with me um, or any of my colleagues as far as as far as they've told me. I think that, again, for us, our job is to focus on the issues, right? And those issues are issues that are important to Canadians, are important to make sure that we maintain the strongest possible ties. Um, and, you know, we have a, a caucus. Well, we don't have it. The, the House, uh, the uh, Congress just mm -hmm. uh, established a caucus on Canada, bipartisan and bicameral, which means it's House and Senate, Republican and Democrat. And it was founded and conceived of by Republicans who, through sort of U.S. efforts and priority on reshoring and friendshoring, realized that maybe they were paying insufficient attention to the way in which Canada was helping them secure their security on critical issues, on critical materials and strategic goods. And so now we have this caucus of 62, I think, now members that are wanting to talk to us again about the issues. And as I say, they come from Mississippi, they come from Alabama, we come from across the country, um, and they're not interested in talking politics. They're interested in talking about the things that matter to their voters. Okay, so because it hasn't been seen or come up yet, doesn't mean, I, I mean, they're in the heat of the, the primary cycle mm -hmm. and, and, and the campaign cycle, but it doesn't mean it won't get noticed, especially if it accelerates, because clearly this liberal government here in Canada sees an opportunity in this or, the, or they wouldn't be doing it. I mean, is there the potential, you think, that this could spill over into the U.S. and potentially make the relationship building more difficult? I, you know, I, I, I don't think I, I don't know if I, if I can say whether it will or whether it won't. I think that those people who are supporters of former President Trump are proud supporters of former President Trump. Um, and they're, they're proud supporters of his policies. So pointing out his policies may be you know, something that it doesn't necessarily register too much with them. But, and to date it hasn't. So last time, the, the big economic threat to Canada was what he was going to do with NAFTA, mm -hmm. right? And, and look, he's still got to win the nomination. He still has to win the election before this even becomes a, a live threat. But we know Biden is not a challenge there. The fact that this is now Kuzma or USMCA, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, depending on where you are, the fact that it's his, mm. you know, do you think that insulates Canada a little bit uh, from the threat of having, you know, the continental trade agreement uh, put under the microscope again? I think it should. Uh, I think we, we are definitely, that is our view. Uh, this is the agreement of the Trump administration. It is the agreement that he has touted as the best trade agreement that is, you know, that, that's out there. We think it's a great trade agreement as well. And so I think that as we um, approach those issues and should he be inhabiting the White House again, uh, that's exactly where we will start from, which is look at this great agreement that we did. And by the way, that agreement, since it's been in force, has led to record number, record mm. levels of trade between Canada and the United States, between Canada and Mexico, between Mexico and the United States. It's working. So it's a success. And I think that it's important for us to point to that success for the president. Um, and let's not break something that is working really well and as it was intended to work. Just as a final point, Ambassador, as you're doing this, you know, uh, Team Canada approach to the U.S., is the focus solely on that bilateral relationship and on economic and trade ties, or does the conversation extend to the geopolitical challenges like advocating for NATO, for example, and the U.S. continuing to be a ro robust partner in NATO and, and with the defense of Ukraine? Because as, as what we're seeing is a shift in opinion there and an inability to get the aid package they need. Is that part of this effort as well? Yeah, it is. I mean, to be to be frank, it's primarily my job is primarily uh, around our bilateral relationship, right. and so that is, as you say, economic security. It's energy, our energy relationship. It's 
trade, it's business, but it's also tourists, it's also landowners, it's also mm -hmm. investment, like mm -hmm. it's, it's also transportation, infrastructure. I mean, it covers a wide gamut. Uh, but that being said, Canada is a, you know, a staunch supporter of NATO and believes that American participation and leadership in NATO is essential. So when those conversations come up, we will absolutely uh, lean into them. Um, and a lot of Republicans feel the same way, right? I do, I do feel there needs to be a bit of nuance here. It's a complicated country, and that party has many different perspectives within it. Um, and those things will play themselves out over the coming months, and, and, and we'll be able to have, hopefully, some, you know, some, some serious conversations about those issues as we progress with the Americans. Kirsten Hillman, Canada's Ambassador to the United States, thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me.